two trails. Trail number one is in 1991, and that's with our graduate student, Connie Goodwin. She's the one who's trying to figure out the mystery. And very shortly, Connie figures out that what she discovers about the past is going to have very serious implications for the present. But the second trail is in the past, and it's looking at Deliverance Dane and her family. So it starts in the 1680s. And why would it start in the 1680s, when obviously the Salem Witch Trials were in 1692? Well, if you look at the testimony from 1692, People are recalling events that happened 15 years ago as evidence. You know, my neighbor said thus and such to me, and I, I still remember it. She said that I would regret it if I didn't lend her my cow. 15 years ago. And so I thought it was interesting to consider, I thought it was interesting to consider uh, the, an the, the antecedent to a reputation for someone who was going to be accused in 1692. So the passage that I'm about to read to you is dated in the 1680s, and we meet Deliverance's daughter, high up in a tree. The ground slanted away several feet below her, and within the sheltering grasp of leaves and twigs, the girl enjoyed sitting hidden and safe. Her high vantage point gave her the delicious feeling of being able to spy on others without their knowing that she could be seen. Far down the lane, already, she could see Goody James in a straw hat bending in her garden, and well beyond, at the bend in the road, Goodman James driving his mule in the direction of the wharves. Goody James leaned out from her work and pressed her hands into her back, and the little girl smiled. In the yard below her, the girl could hear the rhythmic whistle and thunk of her father chopping firewood. Thud, whistle, thunk, and then the dull clatter of a freshly split log thrown onto the growing heap behind him. Thud, whistle, thunk. She knew the leaves screened her from his sight, and she tried to hold very still lest, she, lest she, be, she be discovered. Since the minister had said those things about idle children in meeting that week, the townsfolk had turned a sharper eye to their offspring. The little girl knocked her head against the tree trunk behind her, wrinkling her nose. Her stomach gurgled, and she pressed her hands to her belly to silence it. Twisting the length of her hair around one finger, the girl peered at the eye-level branches, thinking about food. Though most of the flowers had fallen weeks ago, the apples in the tree were still just tight little buds. She pulled a leafy bud cluster toward her and cupped it in her hands. Already, some of her mother's friends had spoken with approval of her way with plants, and the girl thought shamefacedly about these words of praise as she narrowed her gaze on the little apple knots just forming on the branch. It's a sin to be so proud, she scolded herself, but her stomach rumbled again, and she stared hard at the leaf cluster, feeling her will seep through her hands and drain into the tree branch. Under her eyes, the biggest apple bud seemed to stir and bubble, distending like a blister, straining against its own skin and gradually darkening from pale green to a deep, rusted red. It pressed and swelled in her hands, burbling until it was the size of the girl's fist, then her two fists together, and then all of a sudden it had twisted off its stem and dropped in a sickening moment through the air, only to burst open in a pulpy mess on the ground. Marcy, she heard her father call out, the swinging of the axe suddenly suspended. The girl's lower lip extended, and she knew she was caught. Quadrant of the book. And it is set in 1692. And it's at this point when Deliverance and Marcy and their friend, Sarah Bartlett, are all standing around in the room of Deliverance's house. And they've heard hoofbeats approaching outside. Sarah stood frozen in her place. And so the girl gathered her wits together and moved towards the door. Mercy, her mother stopped her with a whisper. While I'm gone, you shall sign nothing of the book to anyone. Marcy nodded wordlessly, and when Deliverance gestured to the door, she turned, opening it to find the great lurking form of Jonas Oliver, the marker head one town over. He wore the formal cloak of a county magistrate on an official errand. His broad-brimmed hat was thickly covered with <coughs> frost, and snow had gathered on his high shoulders. Behind him, his flea-bitten horse stamped its foot, making a dull thud on the frozen ground. Good evening, Marcy Dane, he said. Goodman Oliver, she said, without warmth. She observed him slowly scanning the interior of the hall, taking in her mother standing, white-lipped at the head of the table, and Sarah, hands clutched together, rooted in place off to one side. The dog was nowhere to be seen. I suppose you'll know why I'm here, he said. Marcy reflected that this was probably the longest sentence she'd ever heard Jonas Oliver utter. I'll just ready myself, Deliverance said pulling on her heavy cloak, taking up the mittens that Mercy had left to dry by the fire. Sarah had roused herself from her reverie long enough to pack some hard cornbread into a parcel, together with a small bladder of cider. All the while, Jonas Oliver waited in the doorway, unmoving, face impassive, 
a gale blowing into the house around him, bringing lots of dirty snow and ice into the hallway. Marcy watched these preparations, feeling the frigid night air washing over her and pulling out with it any semblance of safety or security she might feel in that house. Panic rose in her chest, coursing through her body like a great red and black wave, and she ransacked her brain for an idea, for something she could do to keep this horrid man from taking her mother away with 